Hi folks, it's good to be with you. We're, we're now going to get into the doctrine of hell um, and annihilationism. And there's a couple of things that I, I want to say before we start. Um, the first thing I want to say is that uh, if, you, if you read, uh, which we read in that video of the needs of, of uh, Royal Blood Ministries, but if you read uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. Uh, verse 12, Ye and all that live in godly Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And um, we're living in an age that is that is uh, turning away from the gospel. We're living in a church that is turning away from the simplicity of the gospel. And uh, Paul warns us in Galatians chapter 1 verse 3 I marvel that you are so, verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that calls you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So Paul warns that there'll be people who pervert the gospel, who attack the gospel, who change the gospel, and then there are people who listen to them and take on their ideas. And unfortunately, many, many people today in the Christian church are listening to false teachers they're listening to the Muslims, they're listening to the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, and they're listening to very uh, dangerous modern evangelicals who, which, is, which are popularizing and becoming popular, various views about the gospel. And they're all summed up in that Jesus is, uh, that, that God is love, and that he, 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 he he wouldn't punish people, he wouldn't send people to hell. And this popular doctrine, popular idea, is manifesting itself in many, many ways where the church doesn't preach the wrath of God anymore, the church doesn't preach hell anymore, the church has changed why Jesus died, he didn't die to take out punishment. Um, various views on hell, some take universalism that everybody's going to get saved. Some people take annihilationism. Some people, everybody's going to be annihilated. It's all, all to soften this idea that God is a God of wrath and he would not punish people. And basically what the church is doing is creating a, a God in their own image and a, and a gospel of their own devices. And... You must not listen to these ideas. You mustn't listen to these people. You mustn't listen to their teaching. Because if you do, you'll get infected. You'll get, you'll get taken down with their error. You'll get taken out with what they're teaching. And uh, what is happening is a, is, is a perversion of Christianity, a, a perversion of the gospel. It, what is happening is the secularization of the church because the church is not standing on the word of God it's not standing on biblical truth but it's standing on human reason and men's opinion and so many people will say well how can God in the church many people will say well how can God send people to hell and torture them for eternity it's cruel well, we'll get into the biblical doctrine of hell in a second, but just to say that what is the Bible teaching? What does the Bible teach? And if the Bible teaches hell, who are you or anyone to question God? Uh, and this is really, really the issue. The issue really, ultimately, is people don't like the doctrine of hell. They don't like the idea of people are being punished. 
Well, nobody does. I don't. But number one, it's biblical. And number two, God has a right to be God. You know, God, God <clears throat> every age has a choice to either follow the word of God and then follow the living God or to take bits of the Bible they want and to make their own God. In the 19th century, the liberals didn't like the wrath of God, so they focused on the love of God. They made a God in their own image. And the churches were decimated. The churches were absolutely decimated. They became secular. And if you make God in your own image, you might as well just abandon Christianity because what you're doing is you're making God out of your own mind rather than with the word of God. So without further ado, be warned, be warned. We're living in a secular age where the gospel is being secularized. We're living in an age where preachers don't want to preach hell. Where preachers are fearful of man rather than God. We're living in an age where the church is taking bits of the Bible they want and ignoring bits they don't like. We're living in an age where human reason has exalted itself above the Bible. And many of you out there who, who reject the traditional doctrine of hell, you're doing it on the basis of human reason, not the Bible. You might kid yourself that you're seeing it in the Bible and you pro provide many, many proof texts to prove that hell is not in the Bible. But if you were truly honest with yourself, you really are rebellious because deep down, honestly, you just don't like a God who would send people to hell forever. And because you don't like that, you decide to go to the Bible and look at teachers who, who, are, itch, who, give, who are teaching itching ears, people who want to hear something more easy to listen to. So you go and listen to them who will feed and pander your, you and feed and pander to what you want to hear. And then you'll start to look at scripture and twist scripture and you'll convince yourself you're ever so biblical. But in reality, the motivation is you don't like hell. And so now you've found teachers that reinforce your preconception. And now you look at scripture in a way that you convince yourself that hell is not real but annihilation or universalism is what's in the Bible. And you're kidding yourself. You're telling yourself a lie and you're telling people a lie as you share your new idea that people are annihilated or universalism, everybody's going to get saved. And you perverted the gospel and you've been captured by the devil. Because this is what it is. It's a demonic attack upon the gospel. And you've been captured by the devil because you've listened to the devil. You've listened to the lies of the devil. And you've listened to teachers who are of the devil. Who are attacking the gospel and undermining the church's proclamation of the gospel. And you've been captured by these evil doctrines because you've listened to them you've listened to the devil and his lies rather than truly listen to the word of god okay and make no no bones about it and i say this with reverence and i say this with love but if you believe in the doctrine of annihilation or if you believe in universalism or any wonky doctrine of hell where you don't believe in the traditional biblical view that people are sent to a lost eternity where they are consciously suffering for the sins that they've committed. If you don't believe that and you believe in annihilationism or you believe in um, universalism, these are doctrines from the very pit of hell. 
They are from the very pit of hell. Make no more bones about it. That you become heretics. That you're a heretic. And you're proclaiming serious heresy. Because it doesn't stop there. It's like cancer that gets a grip and it, and it poisons your whole body. These doctrines poison the whole doctrinal system of Christianity. They eat away like acid at the very foundations of the faith. And they will destroy your faith. They will destroy your church. They will destroy your ministry. No matter how many people come to your church, thousands of people. that are, I read the other day of a church where loads of young people imbibed annihilationism in a church. You basically destroyed a whole generation of people. A whole generation of Christians. A whole generation of churches. By these evil doctrines. It's like acid. And it will eat away. And there's no future blessing for generations to come. With this kind of teaching. Think of the great. Great people who we're going to look at. Who, who got saved. Who, who, who were used in revival. Were they annihilationists? Was Jonathan Edwards an annihilationist who was used in the Great Awakening? Was George Whitfield an annihilationist who was used in the Great Awakening? Was John Wesley an annihilationist who, who was used in the Great Awakening? God has never blessed annihilationism. He's never blessed universalism. But he has blessed the true doctrine of hell in preaching and then on the other side there has become an even more dangerous thing within the church and I've shocked truly truly shocked over the years the, th the way things have slipped but there are leaders who run big radio shows there are leaders that run big theological seminaries, there are leaders that run big churches, ministries and they are holding the right hand of fellowship with annihilationists and saying that as annihilationists we're brothers and sisters in Christ or even universalists and this is the, from the very pit of hell as well you cannot make and lie in bed with evil. You cannot have fellowship with evil. You cannot have fellowship with insidious doctrines that are destroying the gospel, destroying people's spiritual lives. And it is sad to see so many evangelical leaders in, in big groups like Evangelical Alliance and there are many, I'm not going to name American ones, but there are big groups in America, big groups in Europe, big denominations like the Church of England. But tolerating annihilationism and tolerating universalism, the Church of England in the 1990s made it clear that they don't believe in the traditional doctrine of hell, that they believe in annihilationism. And look at the state of the Church of England today. It's a total joke in the UK. It's a total mess. Morally speaking, it's, it's all over the place. So it, 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 it's terrible that God's church, the churches of, of the living God, have been infected by leaders who are not even willing to call preachers and pastors and bishops and leaders out for their annihilationism. I'm shocked, I'm truly, truly shocked at how terrible and how bad and how, how horrendous the situation is. It's horrendous that we have evangelical leaders compromising and allowing leaders who advocate these doctrines and saying that it's okay, they're brothers and sisters in Christ. They're not. Annihilationism is a, is a heresy of serious magnitude and it is a, a doctrine that will destroy the church. 
It will destroy the church. It will destroy people's lives. And it will destroy the future of the church. And it is not of the Bible and it is from the devil. And it must not be tolerated within church. Any pastor, any leader, any theologian, no matter how respectable they are, must be taken off staff and sent packing if they're going to continue to teach this doctrine. Any pastor who teaches the doctrine of annihilationism must lose their job and be kicked out. Any elder who teaches annihilationism or universalism must be made to step down and they must not be allowed to teach within the church. Any bishop any theologian within a theological seminary or any bishop throughout the world today, if they teach annihilationism or universalism, must depose of their living, of their job, and not allowed to teach. And that there are evangelical pastors and Christian leaders that are tolerating leaders that are teaching these things, it is a sad indictment of the apostasy of evangelicalism and of God's people that rather than stand with men who will preach the pure word of God and preach a, a, a real hell you would rather compromise and stand with people who are in who, who are on the same level as Jehovah's Witnesses because they deny the doctrine of hell Okay, so I did that little introduction just to make you realise under absolutely no circumstance are we going to compromise or encourage anybody to compromise with this doctrine of annihilationism because it is total rank evil heresy. It's evil and it, it's, uh, it's terrible and it must not be tolerated. It cannot be tolerated and it will not be tolerated because it undermines the very heart of the gospel. Alright? Strong words. But they have to be strong in an age that is compromising the truth. When we have high profile pastors and leaders who are giving the right hand of fellowship to to people who to, to scholars and lecturers and theologians and pastors who proudly say that they believe in annihilationism. You must not give them the time of day, publicly speaking. You must cut them off and say, no, we're not having it and we don't want that teaching, we don't want to listen to it, we don't want our churches infected with it. We want to stand on the pure word of God. Okay, so, what does the Bible teach about hell? I'm sorry that I'm, I'm strong on that, but I've studied this doctrine of annihilationism now for about five, well, it's about, about three or four weeks, but full, full five days, reading tons of material, and it's my considered opinion that this doctrine is like acid. And if you allow it near you or near your church, it will destroy you and it will destroy your church. Now this is an article called The Biblical Evidence for Hell by Christopher Morgan. It's on Legionnaire Ministries. It's a really excellent article. So this is our introduction. And... Uh, he says, in the Sermon on the Mount, after known for its emphasis on love and the kingdom, Jesus teaches the reality and nature of hell. So this is The Biblical Evidence for Hell by Christopher Morgan on Legionnaires Ministries, legionnaires.org. And so let's just look at a few verses. Um, Matthew 5.20 
Matthew 5.20 it says Twenty to thirty. Matthew five twenty to thirty. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said by them of old, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to the brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall thou fool, thou shalt be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring... So, there it's saying, if you, if you get angry, there's the danger of hell fire. So, the Lord is seeing sin seriously. We, we don't see sin seriously. But here it's saying, well, even if you get angry, you're in danger of hell fire. This is serious. So God sees sin as really, really serious. If you turn to uh, it, Morgan writes, Jesus contrasts hell with the kingdom of heaven and warns that hell is a real danger to unrepentant sinners. The fire of hell, the justice of hell, and the extreme suffering of hell are particularly stressed. The unrepentant are warned to use extreme measures to avoid being cast into it by God. Then if you turn to Matthew 7.13, it says, Enter you in the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go therein. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. We're warned about false prophets. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes and thorns, or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. What is the fruit of annihilationism? Does it produce holiness? Does it produce a vibrant church? No, it, it, it secularizes the church. A good tree cannot bring forth uh, evil tr fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is you down and cast into the fire. Whether by their fruits you shall know them. Not, ev not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of the Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name I have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I confess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work as iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these things, sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken unto him a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and fell not, uh, and it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, when he built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when the Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. So here the Lord is saying, there are false teachers, that if you don't build on his teaching, you're building on sand. And he talks about hell there. So if you're not going to follow what Jesus says about hell, you're building on sand, you're not building on the rock. He goes, as Jesus concludes the Sermon on the Mount, he contrasts the kingdom of heaven with the horrors of hell. Jesus cautions that hell is a place of destruction, depicted as the end of a broad road. Hell awaits everyone who does not enter the kingdom of heaven. Even those who profess to know Christ but continue in sin. Jesus is judge of king and personally excludes the wicked from his presence of the kingdom of heaven. Depart from me. Matthew 7.23 Indeed those who fail to follow Jesus are like a house built on the sand and ultimately come crashing down. Matthew also recounts Jesus' surprising warning that Jews devoid of faith, devoid of faith are in danger of hell. Which betrayed as outer darkness a place of intense suffering. 
Matthew 8, 10 to 12. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said unto them, Follow, verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the west, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So that's clear that it's out of darkness, people will be cast into darkness, not annihilated. Jesus addresses hell when he commissions his disciples not to fear humans, but God, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. In Jesus' parable, now that's a favourite one of the annihilationists, which we'll look at later, but he's using it because he believes it teaches hell. In Jesus' uh, parable of the weeds in uh, Matthew 13, 36, Matthew thirteen thirty six says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed of the Son of Man. This is the field in the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers and the, are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, they shall gather out the kingdom, all things that offend, and then which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a fire furnace, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth of the sun in the kingdom of theirs. Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And then 47 to 50. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew the shore and sat down and gathered the good in the vessel, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever and wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Ellie is seen as exclusion, separation from God, described in terms of fire. It is a place of suffering. J Jesus later describes hell as a place of eternal fire. Matthew 18, 8 Wherefore, if thy hand or foot offend thee, cut them off, and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter life halt or maimed, rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy end eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life than one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you despise not. So, it's quite clear that the fire is eternal. Why would the fire be eternal? Even warns the scribes and Pharisees of hell and characterize it as inescapable for the unrepentant. 2333. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? So there, it's, it's the Pharisees believed in hell, so it, in eternal torment. So it's clear there that that is about a, a, a period of suffering, a long period of suffering for sin. Uh, Matthew 24, 45. Who then a faithful and wise servant, whom the Lord hath made ruler over the house? Blessed is the servant whom his Lord he cometh shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all the gods. And if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, 
I shall begin to smite his fellow servant and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of the servant shall come in a day when, when he looketh not for himself, for him, and in an hour that he is not aware, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with his hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So, it's, it's quite clear there that it, it's, a, it's severe judgment. Then if you look at uh, Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13. Then shall the kingdom of heaven liken unto the virgins which took their lamps and went forth. And five of them were wise and five were foolish and they were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took the oil of their vessel with their lamps. The bridegroom tarried and they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, and our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us. And you, go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. And afterwards came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, you know neither the day or the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So these virgins were shut out. They were shut out. They're not annihilated. Um, You turn to Matthew twenty five, fourteen and thirty. For the king of heaven is a is a man travelling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them the goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, another one, and to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. And he that had received the the five talents went and traded with the same and made them over five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that received one, went and digged into the earth, and lorded his money, and hid his lord's money. After a long time, the lord of those servants cometh, and reckoned with them. And so he that had received five talents, came and brought over five talents talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents, behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things, enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that received two talents came to him and said, Lord, thou deliverest thou unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathered where thou hast not strawed. Straw, straw. I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, uh, thou hast this that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not, not strawed. Thou orders therefore to have put my money to the ex exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received my own with ushery. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto, unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. 
and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can't get clearer than that, that that's hell, eternally. And then, 31 and 46. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he set down the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the kingdom say unto them, on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom, prepared for you and for the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we that a hungered, and fed thee, a thirsty, and gave thee to drink? When saw we the stranger, and took thee, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we the sick, or in the prison, and came unto thee? The king shall answer and say unto him, them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then he shall say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you curses into everlasting fire, preferred for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not sick. And in prison you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hung hungered and the thirst and a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say to you, inasmuch you did it unto one of the least of these, you did it to me. And they shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. I think Matthew 25 is, is pretty, uh, pretty conclusive that it teaches eternal uh, punishment. Um, so he goes on. Hell is punishment for disobedience to the master. Hell is graphically expressed as a location where people are cut in to pieces and placed with the hypocrites, 2451. A place of suffering, 2451, 2530. Jesus also likens hell to being outside or a place of exclusion, separation. Matthew 25, 10. 12 and 30 as the outer darkness matthew 20 verse 30 a personal banishment from him his presence of the kingdom depart from me verse 41 of uh, matthew 25 and there's just condemnation and punishment verse 41 and 46 of matthew 25 in mark we have mark chapter 9 verse 42 48. Whosoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great milestone were hung round his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than two feet to be thrown into hell. See, you've, you're thrown into hell, you're in a place, and if your eye causes you to sin, tear it, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, you couldn't get anything clearer than that. In Luke, we have Luke, 13, 1 to 3. There were some present at the very time he told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, Do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Because they suffered in this way? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you likewise will perish. Those 18 whom the tower of Solomon fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all others? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish.
Luke 13, 1, 5, Jesus speaks of hell as a, uh, as punishment for the unrepentant and those in hell as betrayed as perishing. Then you have uh, the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who clothed in purple and fine linen and feasted sumptuously every day. Now this gate, this is um, Luke 16, verse 19 to 31. There was a rich man who, clo who was clothed in purple and fine linen and whose feast sumptuously every day. Now this gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores and desired to be fed with what fell from the richest man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by his angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off. And Lazarus had his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus like manner bad things, but now is he comforted here, and you are in anguish. And beside all this, between us and you are a great chasm, has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from here to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that they may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone would rise from the dead. Uh, I mean, that that's pretty conclusive. I mean, people will try to water this down and say it's a parable. But even if it's a parable, it, it's teaching eternal torment. And, and also, it's teaching on the basis of God's justice that people have had warnings. But Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone rise from the dead. So in other words, they, they've got the law, they've got a, a conscience, but they don't want to listen to God, they don't want to follow God. So then we have hell in Paul, it, it would take too much space to survey all of Paul writes. But he goes, uh, this is in uh, 2 Thessalonians, uh, for the first punishment is connected to God's wrath. The wicked are presently under his wrath, so this is 2 Thessalonians. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.18 No, sorry, Rome, the book of Romans, the book of Romans, sorry. Sorry about that. If you go to Romans, Book of Romans. Book of Romans. So, 1, 18 to 32. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because they which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things from him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that which we know of God were glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became a vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like uncorruptible and birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things, wherein God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their bodies, 
between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed for ever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their woman did change the natural use into that which was against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in the lust one towards another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which is not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, bolsters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. So that's teaching uh, the wrath of God, you know, there is a wrath of God. Um, and we can store up wrath, 2.5. But after the hardness of the impediment heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. So he's saying in Romans 1 there's death and, and it's obvious that it's not just physical death, it's spiritual death. And then it goes on there in Romans uh, 2.5 that the story not wrath, more wrath, not just wrath to be killed. We're saved from the wrath in Jesus in Romans 5, 5, uh, 9, 21. Much more than being now justified by the blood, we shall be saved from it, the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Wherefore by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all of sin. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the grace of him that was to come. But not as the offence, so also is the free gift. For if through the offence of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, and the gift of grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offences unto justification. For if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more then they which receive abundance of grace and of of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offence of one judgment came unto all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of the free gift came unto all men unto justification of life. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That is, as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. As you see what he says. First, future punishment is connected to God's wrath. The wicked are presently under his wrath. Uh, in Romans 1, 18-32, our objects of wrath, Romans 9, 22, continually store up wrath for the day of wrath, Romans 2, 5, Romans 8, at Romans 3 5 and can be saved from wrath only by faith Romans 5 9 21 second future punishment is God's judgment the wicked are deservedly condemned under the judgment of God which is impartial true righteous and certain this condemnation is the result of sin and is just punishment for sin 
Romans 6, 23, Romans 2, 1 to 12, Romans 3, verse 7 to 8. Third, future punishment will consist of trouble and distress. The suffering shows no favoritism between Jews and Gentiles, Romans 2, 8 to 11. Fourth, the future punishment consists of death and destruction. Sinners deserve death, Romans 1, 32. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 6, 23. As sinners, we bear fruit for death, Romans 7, 5. And those who live according to the flesh should expect death, Romans 8, 13. And sinners are vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, Romans 9, 22. Fifth, both sin and future punishment are separations from Christ, accursed and cut off from Christ. I think that's Romans 9, 3. For I would that myself were accursed for Christ, for my brethren, kinsmen, according to the flesh. As he encourages believers suffering persecution to Thessalonians, Paul stresses that God's justice will prevail. In a just few verses, Paul emphasised several important truths about hell. Hell is the result of God's retributive justness. Hell is punishment for those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel. Hell is eternal destruction. Hell is exclusion from Jesus' present soul. You turn to 2 Thessalonians 1.5. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 5 and 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 5 and 10. For our gospel came unto you in word only, but also in power, in the Holy Ghost, ye followers of us, of the Lord, and we received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Ikea. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Ikea, but also in every place. Your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us that manner of entering in. Sorry, I've written, sorry, I got the wrong one. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 5 and 10. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, he shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So... The everlasting destruction there is cast into outer darkness. Hebrews 6, 1 to 3, Therefore let us leave elementary doctrine of Christ and go unto maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance and dead works and of faith towards God and of instruction about washing and laying of hands. Hebrews 10, 27, 30, But a fearful expectation of judgment, a fury, a fury of fire, will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the Lord Moses die without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much more worse punishment?
But if, yeah, Hebrews 10, 27, 30. But a fearful expectation of judgment and fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the Lord Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled under the foot of the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit? For we know him who, who said, Vengeance is mine and I will pay again. The Lord will judge his people. So I mean that's very very clear that that's saying there's punishment be beyond death, you know. So false prophets 2 Peter 2 1 but false prophets also rose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destruction heresies even denying the, ma the master who bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction Jude 5, now I want to remind you all that you once fully knew it, that, that Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroys those who did not believe. Again, wrath. But these people blaspheme all they do, do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they like unreasoning animals. Jude 11, woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of the Canaan. Uh, gained to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. And then it says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their power dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains unto the gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Jude 12, 1 to 3. 